Um, it's good to be with everybody, even though it's you know, far away. <laughs> um, so I, my, my name is Rob Rambo and I, I uh, uh, operate the, well, I used to operate the, the uh, Biosex Beam line at B21. Now I'm the uh, head of the Soft Condensed Matter Group. Um, but we, we operate a high throughput uh, beam line that does um, Biosax experiments. So the type of experiments that we do are, are batch mode experiments using an Aranax uh, sample handling robot, or we do uh, size exclusion chromatography coupled SACs, which is uh, principally the, the, main, the main method for doing SACs these days. Um, we operate in a fixed camera length. Our, our detector is an Iger that's in vacuum. Um, we essentially have one single sample environment uh, that's used uh, for, for all the experiments. And because of the uh, COVID restrictions right now, we operate um, only through, through mail-in or remote experiments. So you can mail uh, up to 16 samples to us for size exclusion chromatography sacs, or you can uh, mail a 96 well plate and we'll just run the plate for you. Uh, some, you know, if you're nice to Nicole here, you can email him. He'll actually set up the plate for you. Um, but briefly, uh, why do biosacs? So I wanted to explain the, the background of biosacs and then some of the applications. Essentially, what you have is a, a 1 to 20 microliter sample of your protein. Um, concentrations can range from about 0.01 uh, mg per mil to hundreds of mg per mil. Um, the, the scattering of the object is what we consider isotropic. So that means uh, if this is your beam going down the path, it hits the middle of the detector. Uh, the intensity around the, the beam center is the same. And so as we integrate around the detector, we get uh, a spot here and we keep going down to recover our SACS curve. Um, we talk about, you know, SACS uh, near the beam stop is, is our lower resolution information. And as we move away from the beam stop, this is our higher resolution information. And uh, under sufficiently dilute conditions, so this is the conditions where the, the particles are not interacting with each other, uh, if you take the inverse Fourier transform of this data, you recover what's called the P of R distribution. And this is essentially the set of all paired distances within the macromolecule. So if your macromolecule is changing its structure significantly, uh, you should see changes in the P of R distribution. And it should also be emphasized that this uh, distribution function is resolution limited, meaning that the more information you collect, the more features you'll have uh, in this distribution. So if you collect uh, data to a very low resolution, uh, this, you, you can expect this distribution curve to look very smooth. And if you go higher and higher, you'll start to see more features in the curve. Now, um, you can do biosacs uh, because you can stick anything in the beam and get any kind of data from, from scattering. Um, this kind of uh, sets what you can and can't do with, with the experiment. So if you have a very high sample quality, so this means that the, 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 the protein is purified uh, to high standards or you're doing size exclusion chromatography sacs. Um, you can use the sacs data to do things like ab initio shape de determination. You can complete the structural modeling. So often you might have a high resolution model that's incomplete. So you can use sacs to fill in the rest because everything goes, everything scatters in sacs. Um, or if you have a, a low quality sample you can, use, you can still use that sample for screening. So in this case, what you might be doing is checking uh, conditions for folding, ligand binding, or looking for things that stabilize the protein. And so in this example, what we have here is we had uh, this MUDAS protein uh, and we incubated it with um, ADP, ATP, ATP gamma S, AMP, PMP, uh, and then the same thing with DNA. And what we were interested in here was uh, what condition caused a change in the SACS curve? And then we can arrange these uh, uh, based on similarity, and we can see that um, the biggest change occurred between the APO state and the state that was bound with ATP and a piece of DNA with, with uh, um, a bulge in it. Um, so really, you know, when you think about doing SACS, the question is, what do, you, what do you want? And that kind of determines your experimental approach. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is, is how to use SACS principally to uh, look at conformational change, changes related to uh, the binding of a ligand or uh, a binding partner. So uh, to emphasize this point here, SACS measures billions of molecules. Uh, it's a thermodynamic state measurement because your exposure times are usually greater than 100 milliseconds. Uh, at low resolution, uh, 
Saxon forms on the particle's radius gyration. So at low resolution, what we mean is this small little part here is related to the RG. Um, intensity uh, of, the, of the SAC signal is proportional to mass and concentration. And at moderate resolution, so this is resolution in this area of the SACS curve, uh, the SACS curve decays proportional to surface area. So if you have a very compact globular particle, the decay will be very quick. And if it's kind of lots of surface area like this intrinsically disordered protein, then what you'll see is a very shallow uh, decay of the SACS curve. Now, what's nice about that because of that feature is we can characterize this thermodynamic ensemble simply by taking the SACS data and doing what's called a dimensionless Kratky plot. So in this case, if you look at something like xylanase and glucose isomerase, um, which, which are globular particles, uh, the peak position in this plot should occur at a square root of three and 1.104. And uh, if you see a peak, then we can call it, we can just call your system that it's a globular particle. If it's non-globular, you'll still have convergence down to the baseline, but the peak will shift a little bit. We see that here with the SAM riboswitch. This is kind of a flat RNA looking molecule. Um, and then we can look at things, we can characterize your system as being partially unfolded. So if you see that you do have a peak still, um, um, and it's coming back down to baseline, but it's not here at this uh, guinea cracky point, we call it, then what we can tell you is that you have a biphasic system. So it's likely that you have a particle that's unfolded, but uh, still has some compact features to it. And then if you have something that's completely unfolded, like a random chain, then there's no convergence to baseline. And this is what we have here with uh, rat 51 ap one which is an intrinsically disordered protein. And so uh, to show you kind of how we can interpret that, here we have SACS data of a protein um, uh, in the absence of RNA. So this is a protein RNA splicing complex. It's a 50 kilodalton protein. Uh, when we bind a small RNA to it, which is eight kilodaltons, we can see that in the absence of protein, the peak is up here on the dimensionless cracky plot. And then, it, and then uh, in the presence of the RNA, uh, the peak shifts down to this, uh, uh, the crosshairs here, telling us that we go from an intrins um, a biphasic system down to something that's very globular. And if we look at the P of R distribution, which is a set of all distances within the molecule, you can still get the idea that it's extended in the absence of the protein in the RNA. And then we add the RNA, it condenses down uh, into a discrete shape. Now, the, the issue with RG is that, you know, if your ligand is small, uh, like ATP, uh, changes in RG are easy to interpret. So in this case, a decrease in RG implies compaction and an increase in RG implies opening. So uh, with something like the s methionine riboswitch, which binds this small molecule here, in the presence and absence of, of, of uh, SAM, uh, the RG changes by about 10%, so that you know, readily informs on compaction. But in this case, where you have something like calmodulin binding this helix, uh, the RG decreases, but you know, it's, the ligand itself is quite large, even though the RG decreases, uh, you can still infer there's probably some kind of compaction going on if, if, the, if, the, if this thing bound but the RG increased, it would likely suggest that the binding is happening on the outside of the molecule. Uh, but notable changes in RG often imply significant changes in structure. However, don't expect a conformational change to produce a measurable change in RG. And this can be demonstrated here with the lysine riboswitch. So this binds a small molecule, which is lysine. Um, the, the interesting thing about this was the crystal structure of the lysine bound form an unbound form of the, of the riboswitch. Uh, they crystallized in the same space group, in the same, uh, same condition. Um, the lysine bound state showed a, a very minor reorganization of the RNA residue in the binding pocket. When we looked at the SACS data in the presence and absence of lysine, you can see that the curves look very similar to each other, but it's only really until you transform the real space where you um, uh, do this inverse Fourier transform that you can see that there's a change in the distribution. But this is really implying that in the presence of lysine that there's a very small conformational change. And of course, this was um, uh, validated using chemical probing methods. But for something like uh, a much larger conformational change, uh, you can see with the, with the SAM rivalry switch here. So the, the problem here with both uh, SAM and the subsistic acid binding protein was that in the, in the uh, presence and absence of the ligand, the, the crystal structures were nearly identical. Um, suggesting crystal packing forces were dominating the unbound state. But when we did the SACS, we can see that the SACS data and the unbound state of the, of the riboswitch was very different from the X-ray crystal structure. 
When we looked at that cracky plot, we could tell that it was partially unfolded. Um, and so you can see here again in the P of R distributions that the two distributions are very different. Remember, this, is, uh, this caused about a 10% a, a change in RG, suggesting that the conformational change is quite large. But in the case of the abscisic, abscisic acid binding protein, we can see that in the, uh, in the presence of abscisic acid, the P of R distribution uh, uh, shrinks in a little bit, suggesting compaction, um, but the uh, overall uh, conformational change is quite small, but it was still detectable. And again, this is what's really important here, is that you take the SACS data and convert it to uh, real space. And, and finally, in this other example we have here, which is um, a membrane protein, so this is an amphipole stabilized G protein coupled receptor. Uh, the crystal structure and ligand failed to demonstrate ligand binding. Uh, even though it bound cholesterol, we were looking at a derivative of cholesterol. Um, so we performed site exclusion chromatography coupled SACs. Uh, we could tell that the uh, SACs is dominated by the amphipole belt. So if you look here in the presence and absence of the, the uh, ligand, uh, there's, it doesn't look like there's much of a conformational change going on. But you can see here that the curves at the higher resolution are changing. But you can really appreciate even better once we convert this data to real space, we take the inverse Fourier transform. And you can see in the presence and absence of the ligand, there's a significant conformational change occurring. In fact, that uh, in, the, in the presence of a ligand, the maximum dimension of the particle increases by, by uh, uh, nine angstroms. So this is telling us that when the ligand is binding, that, that somehow the thing is becoming more elongated. But this was all we needed to, to show to demonstrate that the ligand was binding uh, to corroborate some uh, information that they had on, on uh, uh, cell biology experiments. So, so these examples here, you didn't really need to, to take to, well, to demonstrate the, the binding of the ligand, you can kind of perceive um, uh, or demonstrate the, the, the binding through looking at the P of R distributions or looking at the crack key plots. But you know, if you, if you do have a situation where you have the crystal structure um, and you want to uh, get a better idea of how the ligand is affecting it using an atomistic model, then you have to look at some methods that, that, uh, that, that kind of look at uh, uh, some kind of molecular dynamic simulation. So this is using a program like CNS or Haddock. Um, uh, and typically what you do is you generate a lot of confirmations using some kind of uh, constraints. And then the SACS data is used as, as, a, as a filter to try and, and understand what changes are happening to the structure in the presence of the ligand. So what was neat about the, the s adenosyl methionine ribose switch was um, uh, uh, in the absence of SAM, you can tell there's a very big conformational change. Uh, we, we were guessing that the structure is partially unfolded, but the helices would remain intact. So what we can do here is use the helical segments uh, as, as uh, modeling constraints, rigid body, rigid body constraints, and this just do a series of high temperature simulated annealing runs to generate a large ensemble of structures. And then we use a program like ensemble optimization method by, by Ian Bill, uh, Dimitri's group and select out the structures, the combination of structures that best uh, fit the data. And what we could tell here is that in the absence of SAM, uh, these helices P1 and P3 are opening up um, and this is where the ligand binding pocket is. So that kind of makes sense. Um, and similarly, uh, for another study here, which we've done recently with a, with a, a CRISPR defense DNA nuclease uh, with, with Tracy Gloucester's group at St. Andrews, um, they, they crystallized this nuclease in the presence of, of a signaling molecule. Um, the APO structure failed to crystallize. Um, so we collected SACS data on it, and we can see that in the presence and absence, uh, looking at the P of R distribution, in the presence and absence of the ligand, it's a very big conformational change. And so we used that similar approach of using CNS and did some directed molecular dynamics simulated annealing. And we can pull out uh, that, that to satisfy the SACS data here, we needed a combination of closed states and open states uh, to, to best match the, the SACS data. And so, you know, if you think about fragment screening here, you know, you wouldn't necessarily find a fragment that would prevent closing of the structure. And the same thing goes with with the previous structure here with the, with the SAM ribose switch, you know, if you really think about it here, could you actually uh, find a fragment in, in a screening mechanism that would prevent the closing of the ribose switch 
Um, and the same goes here with the, with the nuclease. And so finally, in this other example here, what we have is rigid body dynamics, uh, where we wanted to do some kind of uh, docking. In this case, we had this very large protein uh, that bound an antibody, and the complex failed to crystallize. And so the question that we were interested in was, is the, is the uh, antibody binding the, the closed state here in blue, or is it binding this elongated state in orange? So uh, based on the SAC state of the complex, we can use the P of R distribution uh, to derive distance constraints. And we, we use those distance constraints to anneal the, the assembly uh, using the NMR routines in CNS. And what we can tell is starting with the open state um, and the antibody, we can uh, produce a nice structure here that fits the SACS data. Whereas if we kept it in the closed state um, and, and targeted the, the epitope, you can see that the best fit here is, is poor. So here SAC state is being used as a filter, but we can at least uh, provide our, our users a sense of how the, the antibody is binding this, this target protein. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity to present. And um, uh, if you'd like to do SACS at B21, uh, Nathan Cowson here is the, the PBS and Nicol Kunti is the organizing the, the mail-in uh, for INEX Discovery. Thank you, Rob, for 